Hello, I'm Atubo George, and I'm so blessed to be bringing you God's truth today. And I also welcome you to my YouTube channel. Now, if you have not subscribed to our YouTube channel yet, why don't you just pause and press that subscription button? If you're watching this from any other platform, go to YouTube. The link is there and subscribe to the channel and put on the notification button. It will help you. Praise God. And then also, it will help more people to receive this message. Of course, the more subscribers we have, the more reach we will be getting. So that's one way to partner with me. Subscribe, put on the notification button, and then also share this message. If you have been blessed, then let others get blessed also. Praise God. Oh, glory to God. Now, before we go into today's broadcast, I already know it's going to be a great week. I feel it and I know it. Why? Because God has given his word for you. Praise God. Anytime God gives his word, you just know that he is involved with that matter. But before we go into what God has laid in my heart to share with you today, can we make demand for our daily bread? Join me. Be bold about this. Release your faith and say with me, say, Father, I demand right now my daily bread. It's coming to me in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. A miracle is going to take place in your life. Praise God. Listen. Jesus have told us that the reason he came is that he will give us eternal life. And if he have come to fulfill that ministry, then let me tell you this truth, your life shouldn't be normal. It should reject the normal life. Reject life that like every other person is living. You are different. Don't be shy about your difference. Don't be shy about owning up to your difference. Sometimes, you know, as believers, we just want to feel normal. Let people, hey, you are not normal. You, being normal is faking it. Yes. Being normal is your acting. You are faking it. Your real life can never be normal. It's impossible to be normal. Do you know what it is? To be born of God? Do you know what it is? To have angels as your assistants? You don't really know. If you know, you will not be living the kind of life that you live. See, when I tell you things like this, it's to spoil you up. It's to stir up your heart and make you realize what is wrong with me. Yes, it's a good question to ask yourself, what is wrong with me? Jesus said, I am come that they might have life and that they might have it abundantly. What do you understand from that? Where is the abundant life that you have received from Jesus? In John 3, 16, we started that. No, we're still talking about the revelation of eternal life. So Jesus said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Okay, has the son been given? Yes. Do you believe in him? Okay, you claim to do. So where is the eternal life that he spoke about? I'm talking to you that want to live a normal life. Everything about your life can be so explained. Oh, he, he, he went to a good school. He, he studied. He came out with good grades. He got a good job. And now he, he's working in a good firm. And he has a good family. And that's all that's about your life. Oh, no, no, the difference about my life is that I'm saved. Where is the salvation? Now, how do you quantify your salvation? How, what, what makes you think you are saved? Because you go to church? Come on now. John says, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as your soul is prospering. So there is the prosperity of the soul. What does that mean? There is the moving forward of your soul. And how does that take place? By the renewal of your mind. How is your mind being renewed? By the word of God. 
the word of God, not just the Bible, the word of God, God speaking to you. That's what renews your mind. And when your mind is renewed, what is it renewed with? It is renewed with power. Power and ability, not just a change of idea. No, there is an ability that comes with this new idea as long as it's coming from the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit that gives us the word of God. Without the Holy Spirit, you can never receive the word of God. You know, when, 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 I, when you hear me say this, and I'm going to say it again, that the Bible is not the word of God. You know, people, people just think, oh, it's a controversial. It's not a controversial statement. That is exactly what it means. The Bible is not the word of God. What is the Bible? The Bible is a compendium. I want you to listen to me. The Bible is a compendium of testimonies of people that received the word of God. What they did with it and how they turned out. That's what the Bible is all about. Now, am I saying the Bible is not important? No, it's the most important book on earth. You ignore the Bible, you're the most foolish human being that will ever be. You know why? Because everything written in the Bible is true. Everything written is true. You see, before, they, before people compiled it together, they did lots of checks. And they, they all agree that these books, these events are verifiable. Are ah, you getting what I'm saying? So they put them together. Now, what makes the Bible unique is this. It is not just telling stories of events that took place. Now, there are many books on the earth. I'm not even talking about only religious books. There are many history books, for example. You see, now the Bible can qualify as a history book. Understand me, understand me. Before you misquote me now. I said the Bible can qualify for an history book because all the events that are written in there are events that have taken place. You see? So one good thing that the Bible does is it preserves history. But there is something unique about this particular history. It is not just telling us what events that took place. It shows us the interaction between God and man. So the Bible gives evidence that there is a God who communicates with men. And when, they when men receive that communication and act on it, things happen in their lives. So you see interjections of supernatural events written in the Bible. Another reason the Bible is so important for today and tomorrow is because it contains prophecies. This is a very important part. It contains prophecies. Now, prophecies of things that were spoken by God, some of it are yet to come to pass. So it's a book you used to monitor. Are you following me now? Yet, God did not sit any man down. And say, I want you to give you scriptures of the Bible. Take up your pen and write. It shall be compiled into a book. And this shall be my word. No, sir. Everything you read was God's de dealing with the people he was dealing with. Thank God they were able to document these things. And now it was put together and delivered to us. So it's a very important book. But don't get it wrong. And, and you see, sometimes you, you, you know, when, oh, I'm going to explain that to you. When you are not a doer of the word, there is a certain knowledge you will never access. If you're not a doer of the word, there is certain level of knowledge you will, ne you can, because those, no they cannot be taught. Nobody can teach you certain things. You only experience it and then you learn. See? So now, Everyone you read about in the Bible, all the stories you read about in the Bible are concerning men who encountered God. Now that's what makes the Bible unique. And that's what ties all the 66 books together. There is an encounter with God. There is 
an intervention with, of God in human affairs. Every book in the Bible, that is the story that ties everything. You know, I hear people say the book of Esther is the only book in the Bible that God was not mentioned. You know, it, it's funny, but the book talks about God. They both spoke about how God intervened in Mordecai's life, saved him from execution, turned things around for the Jews, for him and for the Jews. Who did that? God. Esther told the people, let them go and fast and pray. Fast and pray to who? To God. So the book clearly, and that's why it was included, it clearly told the history of when by the decision of one woman, supernaturally events turned around for the whole, uh, the, the whole people of Israel, the whole Jewish nation. So get these things right. And why am I sharing this with you? So you will know the difference. And when you say, I'm going for the word of God, you will understand. Because if you don't know this, you will understand what we're going to be talking about and what we've been talking about. So you take the Bible and you read. And while you're reading the Bible, this is the right attitude. Wow. So God can do this. Uh -huh. If he can do this then, he can do it now. Or you turn it to a question, Lord, if you did this, what about me? Can you do it in my life? And that's how we go in search for God. And that's why I say everything you read in the Bible is true. Every one of it. No exaggerations. No make-believe. They are events that happened on earth. So if you see God do something there, if he did it then, he can do it again. Praise God. And what you should be concerned about is him doing it again. Because that is what makes the Bible true. The, the coming alive of the events even today is what makes it true. If the events cannot be replicated today, then it casts doubt on the things that we read. But you know what's going on? We have not believed God yet. Oh, we have not believed Him yet. We have so limited ourselves by the things we read. We read them and we are happy. We talk about them. We preach them. We argue about them. But hey, hey, let's move to probing. Lord, if you did this thing in David's life, what about me? If you did this in Elijah's life, what about me? So you find people who, who are, I'm sorry to say, I, I, I call such people Pharisees or even Sadducees. They feel they are custodians of the scriptures and now they want to use their knowledge of the scriptures to wrongly advise God's people. See, we are called to believe the scriptures. And why do we believe the scriptures? So that it will come alive in us. We are not called to believe the scripture so that we will now become mindful and gentle, gentle that we cannot hurt a fly. Brothers and sisters, there is power. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ for it is the power unto, it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. The gospel that we preach is the power of God. How is it the power of God? It makes it alive the reality of God. So when a man hears the gospel, what is he supposed to do? He's supposed to connect with the God that he's hearing about and let God be made manifest in your life. We don't just read and say, oh, I believe what I have read. Thank you, Lord. Some people think they are saved, but they are not. Salvation is practical. It's not just something like, I know I'm saved though because I, I went out for that altar call. Going out for the altar call doesn't make you saved. Oh, no, no, no. I confess Jesus as Lord. Confessing Jesus as Lord, I mean, verbally speaking and saying Jesus is Lord, doesn't mean you're confessing Jesus as Lord. It doesn't mean you are saved. To confess Jesus as Lord means to acknowledge from your spirit, from your heart, that this is the truth about this man. He is Lord. Now, you see that realization. 
not because a pastor told you to say after him. That realization, I, I tell people this most times, when we preach in a crusade ground, it's not when people come out to the altar that I say, say after me, no, sir. The right altar call that we are supposed to be making is how many of you have believed in Jesus while I was preaching this message? That's the right altar call. Because while someone is listening, suddenly it dawns on him that, come on now, Jesus is Lord. You see, what's going on? While the preacher was preaching, the Holy Spirit was in the midst of the people convincing their hearts and letting them know that this thing you're hearing is true. This Jesus, he is Lord. And suddenly there's a realization in them. When that realization takes place, from that moment, there's a shift in their reasoning. And that's how salvation comes. It's not the calling out people say, say after me, Lord Jesus, they can't even say the words. They don't even understand what you're saying. They are just pronouncing. And then you now finish and hundred of them came out. You now finish and say, you are all saved right now. You take down their names. But you now say hundred people gave their lives to Christ today. I told you last week, there's a difference between being saved and giving your life to Christ. There's a big difference. So lots of people have been saved, but they have not given their hearts to Christ. I'm telling you the truth. There are many of them roaming the streets. They go to church. Some of them are even preachers. But the Holy Spirit has no control over their lives. They still do things the way they want to do things. To give your heart to Christ is you willingly surrendering your mind to say, Lord, from henceforth, you lead the way and I'll follow. Any decision I want to take, I want to first of all, Think about it and says, what does God think about this thing? And when I'm convinced in my heart that my mind is in line with the thoughts of God, I boldly take that decision. That's one who's giving. Now, you see, he has given his heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. So, you know, God said in Isaiah chapter 50, 55, he said, let the, let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous his thoughts and let them turn to the Lord. See, forsake your thoughts, forsake your way. Turn to the Lord. So, okay, I would have done this thing, but what, what, what does God think about this thing? That's turning from your way. See, now it is a deliberate thing. It's not something that just happens. It's a deliberate thing. You see, now, when we receive the Holy Spirit, now that's what happened at salvation. When we receive the Holy Spirit and He dwells in us, he is now there. What is he doing? He's knocking. Jesus said in the book of Revelation, I, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any would hear my voice and open, I will come in and sup with him. Brothers and sisters, do you realize he was talking to a church? He wasn't talking to unbelievers. He was one of the latest to the churches. So he was talking to a church and he said to the church, that is the saved ones. You know what I mean by that? So he was talking to the church and then he said to them, I stand at the door and knock. What is the door he's talking about? The door of your heart. Now, when a man is saved, it's not, let me just say this and then we close because of time. When a man is saved, this is what happened. The Spirit of God comes to live inside him. You see that? Then from that day, he begins to knock at the door of your heart. The door of your, of your heart means the door of your mind. Allow me. Allow me into your mind. Allow me into your mind. Allow me into your mind. Because your mind is your operating system of your life. Your mind is the operating system of your mind, of your life. So Jesus wants to take over. He wants to influence your mind. He wants to control. You know what I mean by control? Now I'm not talking about remote control. You just wake up and start doing something. No, that's why he's knocking. He doesn't come by force. He knocks, give me, give me your mind. When he says, give me your heart, he says, give me your mind. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I, I pray, I pray you will willingly surrender your mind 
to the Lord Jesus Christ. He's there. If you have received salvation, He's there. But you see, that's the thing people don't understand about the concept of salvation. So people just think, oh, as long as you came out for that altar call, now you are saved. So it means uh, you are fine now. No, sir. No. The Holy Spirit has come. Now you have a spirit. But what are you going to do with the spirit that you have? The spirit in you is the same as the Holy Spirit. It's one. One spirit. You don't have a separate spirit from the Holy Spirit. It is one spirit. That is what new creation means. Ah, I think I'll have to continue from here tomorrow. <laughs> Praise God. So I pray for you that you will open your mind. Open your heart. You may have to do it deliberately. Say, Lord Jesus, maybe I've not been doing this right. Today, I give you, I literally give you my mind. I give you my heart. You have the right to feel it and control it as you like. Help me live exactly the way you want me to live. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Step out today and become victorious in all that you do. I love you so much. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and share this message. God bless you.